Hey there, you're watching. Reader recap. In the previous chapter, everyone at the party is passing judgment on Irene. But when Irene calls him grandfather again and doesn't get the emotion she was hoping for, she wonders whether she used the wrong term. The envoy then requests the Duke's attention. Duke Morel turns around and tosses the handkerchief at Irene. He informs her that she would be extensively investigated at the next meeting, and he tells her she must be totally prepared, and he promises to meet her again soon. Irene sighs, wondering when the next time will be. She wonders whether Morel would really murder her. And as he goes away, she can only look behind him. Irene is sitting quietly on a garden bench. She feels depressed and sighs as she recalls what transpired during the New Year's Eve party. She then looked for a decent escape route but couldn't discover one. And most all, she can't stop thinking about what occurred yesterday. She proclaimed proudly in front of the entire family that she wanted to leave the house. And this would undoubtedly go down in her sad history. But suddenly, as she is buried in meditation, something occurs to her. Iron examines it and discovers that it is a rolled paper ball. She wonders if it was blown here by the wind, but quickly learns that it was something more. Iron dodges a ball that is heading straight for her head at the last second. She was terrified and is now gazing around for whoever has the ball. And other males behind her back are laughing and calling her a crybaby. Iron turns around to see some lads her age. They inquire as to why she is alone and whether she has a house or pals. Iron is suspicious of them, and the leader of the lads declares that they will play with her in this case. He instructs Iron to get their ball, and in case she doesn't know what a ball is, he instructs her to retrieve what they just tossed at her. Iron is irritated by them, but she is used to being patient in situations like these. But then one of the males informs a buddy that the girl didn't even have a home education, which infuriates Irene. One of the lads who was unaware of this news was taken aback, and their commander informs him that Irene had no second parents, which means she had no one who cared for her in the same way that her parents did. And as they gossip about her, Iron looks back and notices a pebble. One youngster claims that his mother advised him not to play with children who did not have parents, and their captain declares that they will not play with her. He was only teasing her before. One of the lads claims that Iren lacked parents, friends, and a place to live. So what exactly did she have? And after a little pause, their commander continues, Birth secret. Everyone begins to laugh, but as one of the lads looks forward after laughing, he is taken aback by something. He cautiously instructs their commander to glance behind him, and he wonders what is going on. But as he turns around to check what's behind him, he gets a terrible surprise. Iron stands behind him, a hefty stone raised over her head, and she appears to be preparing to smack someone in the head with that rock. As Iron drops the rock, the child cries and scurries to safety. He is afraid, but his pals begin threatening Iren with a complaint to their mother. They also warn Iren that the ramifications will be disastrous for her. But Iren isn't about to be intimidated. She is enraged and requests that the guy inform her mother that having parents with traits similar to theirs makes no difference. It just reflected poorly on them, and it was better for these youngsters not to have them. The lad's commander is enraged, but his comrades advise him to leave right away, and they abuse Irene as they depart. Her life, they say, was miserable. She had nothing except her own life, which she couldn't do anything with. But they were just inciting her fury, and Irene took up the stone once more. She rages that the genuinely sad individuals were those who had never heard of damage compensation, but the lads fled in terror. As they walk away, Irene drops the pebble on the ground and muses about their remarks, and she believes she was indeed pathetic. Her old existence flashes before her eyes. Her brothers thought her clothing choices were humiliating. They went to a prestigious school, and her brothers believed she was too shabby for this institution. Even their friends mocked her, and they were embarrassed to tell others she was their elder sister. Our heroine also recalls her mother's treatment of her. Her mother was telling her grandma about rising property costs, and she was bragging about her two boys and husband. Her mother-in-law had given her a house as a gift for having given birth to two sons. 
she intended to send both of them to a prominent institution. When she began talking about her kid, though, she did not even utter her name. She simply wanted to send her to the dorm if no one else would take her in. Irene considers herself to be the ugly duckling in her family. Naturally, such a thing does not happen. However, it occurs when a dominant person overlooks and despises a weak person. Her parents both disregarded her, which encouraged her brothers to believe she was easily ignored. Erin believes that everyone in her previous family disregarded her. The brothers always got the finest part of the dinner, and all family mishaps were her fault. It was her fault if she ever struggled for anything. Irene recalls being in school and not returning home until late one night. She simply walked to a neighboring park and sobbed to herself despite being injured and bruised all over. But as she is contemplating this, a cat appears in front of her and meows. Irene snaps out of her trance and looks at the nice cat in front of her. She is delighted to see the cat and crouches down to converse with it. Irene approaches the cat and asks if she would want to be her buddy. The cat just stares at Irene, and she strokes its head, explaining that they will occasionally just chat like this. Irene asks the cat whether she comes here often since she meows when she is petted. Her thoughts then turn to what just transpired with the males. She yelled at them, claiming that they had no idea about damage compensation. But what if they truly want it? Irene imagines their mother approaching her and demanding recompense, and what could she give them if they wanted money? She distracts herself, though, with the help of the cat. Irene approaches the cat and asks if she wants to live with her. However, as the cat turns around, Irene feels deceived. Even when Irene commands her to halt, the cat wanders into a bush. For a minute, she is heartbroken, but then she knows why the cat went into the bush. Irene was startled to discover that the cat had a family when she went there to get her babies. The cats are all adorable, and Iren notices that they are all quite friendly as she observes them. But her loneliness holds her, and she is saddened that no one is so welcoming to her. But then the kittens begin to play with her, and Iren grins once again. She decides she is no longer a concerned child. The first thing she'd do was go to Mela and grab some pudding. She bids the cat farewell and returns to her room. She groans, exhausted, yet someone is noticing her. Erno was staring out the window at Irene and thought she was a funny girl. Erno expected Irene to cry when he overheard the males discussing her lack of a home education. Instead, she became enraged and hurled a rock at them. Erno grins and says, I didn't expect that at all. He stares down at Irene, who is strolling with sagging shoulders. He was intrigued by her from the minute he discovered her perusing the list of orphanages at the library, which was intriguing in and of itself. If you were a member of the Etom family, you would do all in your power to keep the family together. But it seemed unthinkable that an illegitimate kid would wish to leave the house. But there was something more about Irene that Erno found intriguing. When he spotted her in the library, he removed his ring and purposefully left it behind, and he waited outside the door to watch what Irene would do next. He now believes that if Irene had not picked up the ring at the time, the story would have stopped there. He wasn't expecting her to pick it up at the time. But when he discovered Irene, she had not only found but also cleaned the ring. Erno sensed the girl was hiding something when she grinned like a child and slipped the ring into his hands. He noticed the ring glistened when he saw it. He sensed a distinct energy emanating from the ring and understood exactly what it was. Erno chuckles, thinking that despite Irene's abilities, she wants to leave the house. But because he is intrigued by her, he wants to present her with a gift. He tells himself that people who do not properly educate their children must pay for it, and his ring glows brightly as he says this. One week has passed, and the New Year's Eve celebrations have resumed. It will resume with Irene's annual plan and her birth mystery, where it left off. Irene is standing before Duke Morel, who informs her that the previous meeting ended on her turn, and he now wants to know why she wants to go. Irene feels worried as she attempts to reveal the mystery of her birth to the Duke. Even though the Duke coaxes her, she is unable to speak effectively. The folks in the crowd are drawing Irene's attention, and she believes there were more this time. 
It was almost as if they were housewives anticipating the next installment of the drama. But Iren breaks her resolution as she recalls all of the emergency monies she has accumulated. And because she is completely prepared to leave the house, she feels confident in telling the truth. When the Duke begs her to disclose the truth, someone mentions that the child was his daughter. And Iren repeats mindlessly, yes, she was his daughter. But then she becomes perplexed by what has just occurred. As she wonders what is going on, someone appears and stands at her side. Iren looks up and discovers that the guy is Erno, who claims to be Iren's father. Iren is taken aback and wonders why he just said that, and she sobs within, knowing she won't be able to see the sun tomorrow. Iren vividly recalls Erno Edom from the novels. He was a horrible hedonist, someone who prioritized pleasure and delight over all else. He never moved until he was genuinely interested in something. But he did anything he wanted, everything and everything. As a toy, he could have whomever he wanted. And if he became tired of it, he would break it so that no one else could have it. And because Iren desires a simple and calm existence, she believes that avoiding him is the best solution. But when she hesitantly grins with Erno, Iren understands that choice is no longer an option. She's already on his mind. Everyone is nervously watching the event as Iren and Erno stand in front of the Duke. Duke Morel is not pleased with Erno's actions and urges him not to make such jokes again. Speaking up for Iren was not appropriate for his position. But Erno merely tosses it off and claims he doesn't care about such things. He was keeping an eye on his daughter. Wasn't his job more essential than that? Morel is now enraged, and the main reason is that he is familiar with his eldest son's behaviors. And Iren is frightened as she attempts to inform Erno that she is not his daughter. She is perplexed as to why Erno was behaving so strangely with her. She merely wants to tell the Duke her secret and then depart. However, she does not believe it was a sensible decision at this time. Mirel resembled a dragon, while Erno resembled a tiger. And Iren does not want to be trapped in the middle of a battle between two animals. But then, Erno urges his father to question his daughter if he doesn't believe him. And Iren is taken aback. Erno had placed the ball in her court, and she now had to make the tough decision. Erno tells Iren that the elderly man would get suspicious as time passes, but he was being deliberately loud, and Morel is enraged after hearing those comments. And Iren believes Erno was so shameless that he could lie without even revealing it. Erno instructs Iren to tell Morel who he was to her, and she hesitates and fidgets, unsure what to do. But Erno's look is making her doubt her ability to tell the truth. Iren ultimately admits that Erno is her father. Duke Morel is enraged. He doesn't believe it and wonders whether they thought he was an idiot. He chastises Erno for continually generating a commotion at New Year's Eve celebrations. He was bringing someone else's child to the celebration this time. And she was that small, fluffy girl on top of it all. However, when the depressed Iren hears the throng muttering among themselves, she discovers fresh facts. It wasn't something new that was happening to her. Erno was infamous for bringing children to New Year's Eve parties and claiming them as his own. It was Iren's turn this time. The youngster he brought the last time was booted out four months later. People believe Iren would only stay for six months in such a situation. Some others are even betting that she will be thrown out before that. And Iren is irritated that everyone is laughing at her problems. She recalls Erno using individuals as chess pieces in the original tale, and he is accustomed to dismissing people. He remained like that even after becoming the main character's adoptive father. When he realized that the others around him did not like the girl, he let her leave. For him, it was simply a commercial connection developed out of necessity. But suddenly, Iren hears something positive among all the negativity. A mother expresses sympathy for the youngster. But according to her spouse, if the child is booted out, Erno would give them enough money to buy a small island. Iren is stunned, and everyone is still chatting. They're curious what a girl like her would do with that kind of money. They feel Iren will simply make a fuss about wanting to stay with Erno. And they believe that with a face like Iren's, she will make every effort to persuade Erno. But right now, Iren's expression is the embodiment of a joyful surprise. 
She believes it's incredible that Erno offered money to children after throwing them out. It worked even better in her favor because she was already planning to go. She believes that if she remains here for six months, she will be able to spend the rest of her life on an island that she owns. That's the type of joyful future she doesn't want to give up. She considers being Erno's daughter to be a part-time job with very good pay. And when he looks at Erno, she wonders if he is a nice guy. Erno is speaking with his father, and he wonders whether he would alter his successor because he has been acting recklessly. Then he catches Irene staring up at him in wonder. He grins at her and says he'll tell her about his goals for the year. He then lifts her up and tells her that his plans were to reconcile with his daughter, whom he discovered late. And he was going to spend the most of his time trying to be a good parent to her. And Morel lashes out at Erno, asking how someone like him could be a decent father. He was even a bad son. Erno, on the other hand, requests that he cease yelling. It frightened his daughter. And Irene is taken aback, wondering when she becomes afraid. Erno, she believes, was attempting to use her as a shield while she was being reckless. But she later claims that she was not terrified of her grandfather. And Erno responds that she was not afraid since she knew her father would protect her. That's all for today. Hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you and see you on the next one.